Okay, so at this point, we're ready to start some uh, real representational drawing with graphite, graphite pencils and graphite crayons. Uh, this will be very basic for some of you who've had any uh, experience in drawing before, but I do want to go over basics so that everyone's caught up to the, to the same level of uh, understanding. Um, we're starting off with uh, white objects done with graphite uh, under a strong light, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the graphites that you have in your, the graphite materials that you have in your kit are a number of, of thin woodless pencils. They are woodless, they are gray, they are sort of silver and shiny. And like uh, all pencils, they have a kind of number and uh, letter designation, uh, usually from 2B, 4B, 6B, and 9B. I think the ones that are in your kit, are, I believe, are uh, uh, 4B, 6B, and 9B. And the higher the, the higher the number, the darker and softer the the mark and the the uh, the drawing value that you're that you're dealing with. So there's this smaller stuff for detail, the smaller stuff for sketching outlines. In the woodless pencil, it had simply it, it's not wooden cased. It's simply a, a solid cylinder of graphite that can be sharpened. The other uh, very useful thing is is the graphite. Uh, crayon and they come in the same uh, number letter designations four six uh, nine uh, and the nine we're going to use today because it, it tends to allow you most um, most variety in terms of lights and darks depending on the pressure and the buildup that you're, that you're using the other uh, drawing materials that are kind of obvious and at the same time uh, could be used in a, in a way that you're not familiar with are the good old kneaded eraser. Okay, this is, you've got one of these in your kit and it's a, it's a gray mass of malleable uh, rubber of some sort, okay, that like bread, kneaded liquet, can be pulled apart and put back together, pulled apart, put back together, pulled apart, put back together, and it's for erasing larger areas. It's like the mop. It cleans up a lot of uh, larger areas on your drawing. The other eraser that you have in your kit, and it may indeed be elliptical as opposed to this uh, cubic thing here, is the plaster eraser, or plastic eraser. And this one here um, is for really hard rubbing and scrubbing to get out some, some deep, uh, dark values, okay? And uh, because it can be fairly sharp in its edge, Especially if it gets worn down, you can you can take your exacto knife and and resharpen it into a wedge of sorts. It can be almost a drawing medium in itself, in the sense that if you needed a high, sharp, defined highlight, you'd scrub a little bit with this and and render that on the surface of medium to 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 dark gray. So don't think of of erasers as just the delete button, just the the way to get rid of stuff. It, the, the erasers, the kneaded eraser can be used to, to make larger areas lighter by picking up uh, like a mop, uh, dusty and, uh, and, and smudged areas. Uh, it can be rubbed over large areas to erase and clean up uh, the white of your paper. Okay? And in, in terms of uh, the plastic, as I've said, it becomes more of a, of a highlight uh, paintbrush whereby a couple of strokes of that will give you uh, a defined, highly reflective sort of value. Um, the, other, the other obvious things that we're going to be using are the drawing board here, okay? Uh, each of your kits has a, a drawing board uh, that's somewhere close to eight, a little over 18 by 24 inches that accommodates that kind of paper. And your, your paper pad uh, which we've reduced this time around to 14 by 17 uh, to cut down expense and it should be it should be large enough to, to work through uh, most of the projects that we're, we're doing this semester so uh, with the drawing board you've taped your your paper to the drawing board now obviously we're we're doing this remotely so all of you are sort of working not in the studio at school, but at home, and, and you really need a kind of flexible, portable surface on which to tape the paper, which to hold at a bit of an angle when you're drawing. Um, you don't have an easel, but you do have a chair, you do have your lap, 
Uh, you do have the ability to, to make it uh, somewhat angled in, re in relation to your subject so that you don't necessarily want to, in fact, you don't at all want to have the drawing board uh, flat on uh, the tabletop of your, of your subject, okay? Uh, it is best to have it at an angle because if you get even a slight angle, it becomes more in keeping with the perspective that you're viewing. In other words, uh, if it's down flat, it's like you're writing the answers to an SAT test, okay? Uh, flat out and everything's going to be foreshortened. Whereas if you bump it up a little bit, it becomes closer to the kind of plane that you're looking at uh, in the drawing. Now I've set up a couple of things here and what I'd like to do for the first assignment, first assignment, first drawing, is not worry too much about a finished project, project a finished drawing, as much as uh, a sketch pad that is a pe pad paper that is a kind of experiment that don't worry about one, one composition that, that fills the whole page. I'd rather have moderate to small sketches, moderate to small experiments, moderate to small practices uh, going around the page, almost like a Leonardo sketch pad or, or, or as you've seen very often, uh, artist sketch pads where they're, where they're trying out uh, various kinds of, uh, of, of subjects on one page, on one page. So uh, we'll begin drawing in just a second. <laughs> so with the, uh, the woodless pencil, uh, that's not too dark, and not too hard and light, uh, I'm going to try to get as best as possible. You can be scratchy and and a bit uh, irregular at first to try to get something of a of a sphere. It doesn't have to be perfect. And with this outline, you know, as I may have said, you're not going for any kind of heavy duty stained glass framing. You're being as light as possible so that uh, so that the values, the lights and darks within that form. Uh, form the very uh, shape that you're, that you're drawing. In other words, contrasts, rule made to be broken, but contrasts, when you're starting out, form a much more interesting border and, and uh, edge to objects than simply hard and fast outlines. So I'm, I'm going to do the sphere here, and uh, I'm also going to do a kind of elliptical, elliptical uh, cast shadow. Underneath here, I'm staying, staying to fairly simple things right now, just to get the uh, just to get the technique down. And I've set up this as if it were a tabletop, as if it were a um, a kind of uh, table edge with darkened space beyond it. You don't always have to draw like this. You don't. It's not a rule, but uh, but it will give me in this demo a bit more contrast if I have what's perceived to be a kind of table edge with what uh, we're calling dark space, almost black space beyond it, so that this becomes a much more uh, contrasted form below. So we'll leave the, the baby ball for, alone for a second and try to get into the, um, into the value structure of, the, of the, the larger sphere. Now I'm going to use the uh, graphite crayon because it gives you an even and, uh, and fairly manipulable set of marks to to fill in and you don't have to do the diagonal that I'm doing it's just very comfortable for my particular uh, anatomy or wrist to uh, to use and rather than trying to press down and make it as dark as you think it should be at first with the graphite it's a very professional it's very controllable to do a kind of layering. In other words, if you, if you get your darker values by simply going over them in a more gentle way, in a more continuous way, in a way that is uh, a kind of more subtle buildup, you end up with uh, much more control and in the end much more uh, of a real looking situation. So I'm going to just basically put that small thing in, thing in there. It's a, strange enough a little bit dark up here. Uh, it's the dark side of the moon. And then moving down like this into the edge. Okay, and this becomes a little bit lighter down here. So, um, 
With cast shadows, this one's fairly dark and defined and not really indicative of what, uh, descriptive of what I'm, I'm going to say right now. But usually with cast shadows in a, in a, in a more lighted room, okay, you'd have the shadow being fairly dark up close to the, to the object and less so as it moves away. This, the light here is so close to this particular object that, it, uh, that it's fairly dark all over and, uh, and there's a little bit of lightness as it moves off to the left and there, because of there, there being other light sources and reflections in the room, there's a little bit of a, of an, of a ghostly, a ghostly uh, shadow, which I might put in uh, in a bit. Okay, but basically it's darker up against the object and lighter as it moves away from the object. Okay, uh, let me get that right. Let's see, this is 9B, so it should be fairly dark. Get it right up against there. And again, I'm not trying to reinforce it or, make, or correct it with any kind of uh, outline. Outlines are fine and can be used in many other kinds of drawings, but for the for this particular one, I'm really asking you to, to concentrate on your sensitivity and buildup of, of lights and darks. Okay. Now, what happens in, and I might use my good old plaster race here, as I talked about in terms of it being a, a, a kind of sharp edge to, to bring definition to things, sometimes a reflection or sometimes just a, an edge that needs to be more defined. Okay, bring this back like this. No, I'm not going to use this too much. There it is. And again, I've done this black background, which is probably a little too heavy duty and a little too dark uh, for your for your particular drawing. But it does symbolize the fact that that if you do things on a tabletop, uh, you have the opportunity to contrast them to the space in back. And just like you would just like you would tape off and paint the woodwork in your bedroom, okay, with uh, with the paint up against the detail, okay, before you do the roller across the entire room, I'm gonna do something analogous to that, something close to that, by doing uh, what might seem at this point like a fat outline, but it's really Hopefully, a kind of um, kind of putting it in space right up against the object, so that it becomes real. It becomes uh, more defined and volumetric in highlight or in shadow by this darker edge and back. It's not the only way to draw, but but this is really about seeing what in, in, in art lingo are values. Light, uh, lights and darks, grays, values that give you the contrast to sculpt, to make things that are, that are 3D. So as we continue filling in the space, uh, you have some options here. This is just going to be a sketch page. So, uh, and even even or a finished drawing, there's no reason why you can't bleed or make more interesting the space around a given object. It does not have to be a kind of flat, filled-in area. And it might be, as in some of Rembrandt's drawings, it might be an opportunity to get a little bit more crazy, a little bit more expressive, a little bit less uh, mechanical with the, with the layering of values. So, another thing to keep in mind with the space, and I'll emphasize this with a full drawing, is that uh, unlike this one, if you were to, if you were to make darker values up top, I'm just going to do it in a section here. If you were to make darker values up top, that then gradually became lighter as you moved it down to the edge of the table or the horizon if it were a landscape, uh, you end up carving out a space 
that looks more illusionistic than simply a flat sort of gray. So there are two parts to this assignment. The first one is your practice sheet, okay? You're, uh, you're dealing with uh, a number of objects, different objects, uh, under a harsh light, you're filling in uh, the outline plus a kind of value structure, a light and dark structure. And this is a, a rather simple version of that kind of thing. It can be more complicated if you want. It can be a little bit more rough if you want. But if you can use one sheet, sheet whereby you've got uh, uh, a kind of uh, athletic experiment, a kind of uh, a training of, of your, your vision in lights and darks across the surface, that'd be great. You don't have to put in all these darknesses and back, although uh, I think they, as I said in the last, uh, the last bit, you know, they really begin to show, show contrasts against lights and darks in the objects themselves. So you define pretty much the, uh, the object without doing a heavy-duty outline. So a practice sheet first. It could be a little bit rougher than this. It could be a little bit more complex and, and have many more than this. But I want you to do a... Uh, an object that is a paper that has many many objects on it that you're that you're practicing. The next one, the sort of more f slightly more finished uh, version of this this assignment would be um, setting up a number of objects. They don't have to be as many as four, but there could be from two to three. Okay, you want some multiples, and here you're sort of arranging things so that they begin to make a composition. We could go endlessly into what compositions are, but I think. Uh, if you keep them within the paper itself, your 14 by 17 inch paper, you're welcome to bring in with a ruler or a straight edge um, a little bit of a margin inside so it becomes a little less uh, uh, huge an acreage for you to fill in. But, uh, but with, a, with an outline composition, uh, you are sort of at first forming the base of your design and your composition that is going to be filled in with the, with the lights and darks. Now I have set up this sort of phony space in back, this, this blackboard, I mentioned it once or, or twice. Um, you, it will help in the, in the drawing of these kinds of objects where you're really getting high contrasts in lights and darks. If you have a tabletop, perhaps a piece of white paper on top of the tabletop, uh, in other words, a lighter surface on which these things are, are lying with a darkened space in back. It may be that your coffee table, your kitchen table, your, your uh, desk at home um, you know, has a kind of space beyond it which could be cluttered with stuff. Don't worry about your, uh, your, your wall TVs, your, your bookcases, your plants, whatever. You know, whatever is in back of this surface here becomes a kind of darkened uh, space that has lots of marks in it that, that show a kind of atmosphere, right? Uh, and that sets up a nice contrast to what you're, you're doing uh, in front. And it doesn't have to be filled in tediously and, and completely black. It can, as I mentioned in the last, uh, the last segment, uh, it can be sort of uh, um, atmospheric and having various kinds of values as long as you stop them at the, at the table's edge. So I'm not going to uh, show you how to fill this in. I've sort of done that in the last uh, uh, sketch process. But, uh, but you, will, you may take one of your papers and, and just um, do a number of small rectangles with, with experiments and compositions, OK? Uh, you know, settle on something that, to you, seems to be uh, interesting. And again, you can bring this in to make a smaller rectangle, which you're going to fill in. So um, that, that's the essential assignment, where you're doing a sheet of practice and a sheet of something a little bit more finished where you set things up. It can be a bit smaller than this, but, uh, but essentially two to two, four objects, uh, at least two, uh, where you've got, as I've got here right now, you've got a fairly strong light that's low. Yeah, see if you can grab your, your, your lamps and your, and your uh, light sources and bring them in relatively close to the object because that'll give you the most the white object that will give you the most uh, the most obvious sculptural strong uh, almost uh, volumetric contrast of highlights and shadows so good luck and as i've said before in the written text you may at any time in fact i'd encourage you to send things in uh, as you're working on them with any questions 
Um, and I'll be glad to critique in progress as well as at the end. All right. So uh, good luck, and uh, I'm looking forward to your work. Okay, so in relation to the solid object uh, volume space drawing in darks and lights, uh, I want to give you a pointer about doing something that's usually a kind of subject that you use in this. Bottles, cans, toilet paper rolls, uh, um, um, paper towels, etc. You know, uh, powerful white objects that are... Uh, that are in harsh highlight, and usually they are cylindrical, some of them. So here's a cylinder, pretty straightforward can, and if you're looking at it from the top, the very top, obviously it's a perfect circle. If you are looking at, at it at an angle, okay, it's what's called in, in perspective foreshortened, it gets squished, and therefore becomes an ellipse, a uh, sort of squished circle, okay? And what happens with uh, those people who are very intelligent, very very uh, good students who want to do what they what they know is there. Uh, they often neglect what they see, and very often with drawing an ellipse, or shall we say, the top of a cylinder on and the bottom of the cylinder, you end up with uh, people doing often something like this, right? Like that becomes something you want to avoid. It may begin to look right, okay. Uh, but you don't do these kinds of things at the end. An ellipse is a kind of continuously tightening curve that strangely enough, okay, that's not so great, but strangely enough becomes a symmetrical continuous curve that is, that is equally tight at the ends and curved top and bottom okay, in a way that's, that's symmetrical. You can almost take a, a kind of crosshairs and dividing line one way and the other, and these are four equal quadrants in a perfect ellipse. So what you want to avoid is this kind of thing, all right, where it becomes a football, a kind of elongated football. The other thing is, the other thing that happens is, you know, you know there are curves at the end, but what happens is that you can, you end up doing a kind of uh, frank, a kind of hot, hot dog, okay? And that's an ellipse that doesn't make sense, okay? Because it is this continuous curvy thing that you're, that you're dealing with. And then you can, if you do get a, a perfect ellipse at the top, if you do seem to do it in a way that is accurate and what you're seeing, the other problem that happens when you come to the bottom of the ellipse is that uh, very often, well, it's sitting on the table, isn't it? It's a straight it's a straight bottom, so therefore this is often the interpretation. And that becomes a mistake because if you are seeing this ellipse at that width on the top, the bottom has to be ever so slightly, depending on the angle and the length, more elliptical, okay? So you can't make it flatter, you can't make it straighter. It's more like this. its ends, and then if it's this kind of, of curve here and you feel that's right, as you're looking at it at that particular angle, then it's going to be slightly more, depending on the height, slightly more curvy down the bottom. Right, that begins to do what, what we're after. And I could probably do it better by making it even slightly more curvy, depending on the, on the angle. So this ellipse, that ellipse, and if, if you had a glass cylinder, okay, if it were indeed a glass, you know, it would be a larger cylinder, excuse me, a larger ellipse at the very bottom, okay, it would be slightly bigger or moderately bigger than the one at the top. This is a certain, this is a certain dimension here, this is a larger dimension here and here. Okay, so uh, pay attention to what you're seeing in front of you, and uh, and it will take a few uh, tries, a few practices, a few um, uh, uh, efforts, but avoid the the bottom, avoid the football, uh, and avoid the hot dog.